Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back. Welcome back, Kata. Welcome back. Oh, I, I better not sing that or we'll get striked. For yeah, sure. don't do that. Yeah. Welcome back, Kata was recorded in front of a live studio audience. Remember this? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Today we have the notorious, the mysterious, the paranese of paranesis. <laughs> the dangerous of the dangerous. <laughs> Jim Donahue, ladies and gentlemen. This is where Marilyn keys in the crowd effect. Maybe, maybe not. Mm. And like the crowd Jim Donahue's main squeeze. <laughs> wife, in fact. Mm. Ooh. Love of my life. Stacy, which yeah. is also known as Stacy's mom's got it going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about that. Maybe that's that, not right. Man. I don't. I yeah, don't I don't. My mom looked nothing like Rachel Hunter, though. No. Oh. Yeah. No, Rachel well, Hunter has been getting funnier and funnier the older she gets. No, I why? Don't know. Huh? What? Why? What? I don't know. I just feel like I had to say that. Am <sighs> I? Are we talking about the, the the around? same woman? Why are we the starting one in the video? Already? The Stacey's mom video. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't she in also in that movie? Um, uh, American Pie. American Pie. <laughs> don't know. Couldn't tell you. Okay, I could be butchering this. <laughs> I'm sure the possible. viewers will correct me. Take two. Entirely possible. No, no we don't want to lose around take here. Take two <laughs> around here. Our we like to let him embarrass just, himself. And that's what okay. it's all about. That's the true game. Okay. <laughs> okay, Donahue. Yes, sir. Stacy. Yes. Where are you guys going? Like, what's going on? Who are you? What planet did you come from? Wait, 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 <laughs> That's wait. A question. Question. Hold on. And and I'm going to stop that real quick. We got to give backstory, man. You just can't throw people in like that and be like, what's going on? Sometimes, Lamar, when you get into a conversation, you don't get backstory. You're but, not privileged to certain things. You're not. But wouldn't the people like to know that Donnie and I started our Wyoming law enforcement career together and this is why he's here? Well, wouldn't one say that's being scripted? No, you came in here. This right you came now, in on here. The you came in here with a thought in your head, and I did not. That's breaking the I rules. I just thought of it right now. How do I? How do you vet that, Lamar? You're a twin. You're supposed to know this shit. Boop boop. Well, bye bye. Technically, bye. I'm a bye. triplet. And there you. And you didn't see this question coming, or this statement. I, well, I assumed at some point that would be part. Okay, of I see what's going dynamic. on here. This is what this is we, good cop we bad cop on things you? here. Yeah, yeah. I'm the yeah. suspect all of a sudden. Hey, hey, hey. See what's going hey, on, Donnie? Hey, Donnie. Hey, Donnie. You play bad cop. I'll be good cop. Okay. Have at him. Nah, I'm good. Um, <laughs> <it's not> good. <laughs> Finish what you were gonna say. I'm just wanting you know let people so they know what's going on, man. Okay, well, go ahead. Fill in the gaps. Uh, so Donnie and I started in law enforcement in Riverton, Wyoming. I'm going to put the fucking city out there because I don't care, Donnie. Yeah, well, I mean, technically I started long before that. Yeah, well, we both As started long before that. I'm true. just, you know, where we first met, That's right? True. I'm just That's trying true. to throw that correlation in there so people get some sort of foundation of who is this guy? Why he's on the, why is he oh, on the podcast? Oh, trust me. When they see me on camera, they're like, oh, we know what that guy used to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, Donnie, you do have yeah, that top I face. Not not ways to go. I can't help. I could point you out in a crowded room, good That's sir. Right. Mm. That's right. You do look tactical, though. Mm. Tactical? Tactical. tactical. <laughs> yeah, brother. Yeah. See, he is a brother. I just, you know. See? Anyways, yeah. Donnie's our long lost twin. Um, <laughs> triplet. 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 Yeah, you're the twins. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm the adopted triplet. It's all matter of perspective. Donnie. You don't mm -hmm. tangle the damn hey, knots, man. Semantics. Yeah. Semantics. Semantics. Hey, tell them, tell them, uh, you want to start with, just tell them how we met and who you are and then the type of shit we got ourselves into. Well... Gosh, how we met. We met the first day that we both showed up for orientation. And it was just instantly we knew that we were going to get along just fine. It was good. I mean, I knew that. 
Yeah, I mean, I felt it. Oh yeah. One would say I felt it in some places where you're not supposed to feel things for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless you're going that I way. I can't say I echo that sentiment. Yeah. But... <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Well, hold on it, here. It was definitely a, a instant brother. Okay, there you go. I will, I will agree to that. Yeah, the feeling is mutual, right? Yes, sir. yes indeed. Yeah. Like, Lamar has a way to make the conversation awkward, doesn't he? Tell the truth, time. man. At times. Yes. But it's you know, it's, it's Lamar. Part, it's part of him. It's part of what yeah. we love about him. See. Yeah. It's a, it's it's appropriate. Yeah, but no, we we started out and started from very humble beginnings at that particular place, and uh, we made it our own the whole time we were there. And it was good. We made a difference. I think we uh, did a good job with the community. We helped a lot of people, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we made things better while we were there. And that was I like to think so for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think uh, we did. Donnie has history on, like, so Donnie is the first person I really told my experiences about the outer body experiences. Mm -hmm. Like, he was the first person that I could go to other than you. Mm -hmm. But that was a, a colleague or someone that I could look up to who would trust me and believe the things that I had to say. Mm -hmm. Do you think I was, when we first met, you think I was different um, prior to the my having those experiences? Mm, no, I think you were the same person then and now in terms of who you are at your core. I think your understanding of uh, your purpose and your direction has certainly expanded over that time. Have you known cops to talk like this with one another, though? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you and I, we put our feelings out there, right? Well, we had lots of good reasons to. Right. I mean, we were uh, both living lives that sometimes were kind of complicated, mm -hmm. and we had, uh, you know— a lot going on at, at work. I mean, there was some pretty uh, serious things that, that happened. I mean, it, you know, some life-altering things at work. I mean, I got I got stabbed and got in a really violent encounter and ended up having to take a guy's life, and you were my right-hand man to help me get through that. And, um, yeah, I mean, you were there for me in some of my hardest times. And uh, Take me back yeah. to that, though, Donnie. Take good. Take me back to when you got that. So I'm, I'm telling you where I, where I was. I was on the couch in my skimmies eating a bowl of fucking Fruit Loops. They were Wa good, too. Huh? Watching TV. They yeah. And I get this phone call. <laughs> they were excellent. And excellent. I get this unsettling phone call, which no officer wants to hear, especially if it's your best friend or your brother, yep. that your your friend has been in, in, a, in a shootout. Well, not necessarily a shootout, but he was involved in a um, officer-involved shooting. Yep. You need to come down here. You've been requested from your captain. Yep. And, you know, they really didn't tell me you were okay. Yep. Walk me through that day when you got toned out when you went 10-8. Well, I mean, it was a, it was a simple thing. Um, I was, you know, working just patrol and doing what, what we do. And, uh, you know, I had a sergeant. There were other people working. And uh, the other guy that was working with me, he got uh, tied up on a haircut. <laughs> right <laughs> get his haircut because that's a priority right? right and uh you know we get called to a a fella at a outside of a local uh store who was just being a problem he was intoxicated trying to fight with people which in riverton was not uncommon by any stretch of the imagination and uh when they said who the individual was i i knew who this person was from the past and you know he's a pretty violent guy sometimes um, and he's also very troubled. He's had a very hard life. In fact, a week before, I'd helped him as he was a victim of a crime. And, uh, yeah, so went and showed up, and sure enough, he was there, and we having a conversation. I just tried to help the man. I tried to get him to go with me and go to someplace safe where he wouldn't be bothering people. You know, he's eating a hot dog and having a soda and trying to fight with people, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, told him he needed to come along. He didn't want to come along, and... Uh, lo and behold, as I'm talking to him, he kind of starts getting aggressive, and I grab onto him and tell him, hey, we're not going to do this here. Just eat your hot dog. Come with me. And about that time, I get distracted by somebody trying to tell me about his behavior, and I look at them. Next thing I know, that hot dog becomes a six-inch knife and gets shoved right in the center of my chest. Right. And, you know, when we started, and I really hate putting departments shit out there, but this department deserves it, right? Yeah. We didn't get up to date equipment. Like no. our our vests were a year out from expiration. Oh, mine was expired. The one that I got. Correct. And I remember you telling me um, 
I don't know if you remember this or not. You're like, my bro, I need to get me a rifle plating Mm -hmm. because it's what I'm accustomed to. We we need to have more protection. And these guys aren't outfitting us with the proper protection. Mm -hmm. And I remember you purchasing it that day. And I was right. So I was a little behind the curb and I was going to order mine, but we Mm -hmm. left. We separated during that time. But I remember when you got yours and you placed it in your vest and you can physically tell Mm -hmm. that your vest stood out. You know, right. like from from everybody else's, you know, so you took that extra step. I don't know what that was to make you buy that at that time it's, mm-hmm. it's as as if you knew something was coming or because you were highly trained in SWAT, you knew that you needed more than just a regular caliber vest. Yeah. You find that ironic that you went and purchased that and that what happened? That's what happens. You know, I, I, I look and well, looking back, I think all of it, it plays in, you know, I mean, my career before coming to Wyoming, um, working counterterrorism and doing things that I was doing. Um, we always wear rifle plates. It just makes you always safer, right? Yeah. Um, whether you get shot or stabbed or in a fight or a car crash or anything, it's just an added layer of protection. And that's what I was used to. And I wasn't comfortable with, uh, what we were given. And so I spent my own hard earned money to get this. And, right. you know, looking back on it, um, there was a reason that I was in that spot versus the guy getting his haircut. Cause had it been him, he wouldn't be alive. Right. And that's the reality. Um, yeah. And fortunately I had that rifle plate and that's what kept me from dying that day. How much of that knife was embedded into that armor? You know, coincidentally, it, it really didn't penetrate the armor very much, but it put a nice 20-degree bend in the middle of this six-inch fixed-blade knife, which Ooh. you know anything about knives. Mm-hmm. He hit that sucker really hard, hard. to get yeah. that to happen. Yeah. Right. And uh, he drew that knife back, and, you know, I drew my pistol, and I had to keep him planted in the seat because we're surrounded by 30-some people, mm-hmm. and there's people within arm's reach. And if he kills me, I don't know who else he's going to go after. And he draws the knife back, and... You know, I told him, put it down, drop the knife, drop the knife. And the whole time I'm having to line up a shot because if he's going to go the rest of the way, I've got to do what I got to do. And he looked at my throat and he started swinging back around and I killed him. Right. And, uh, you know, it scared the hell out of a bunch of people, obviously. Um, and he went down and I removed the knife from him and stepped back and, uh, you know, look a just panic on on everybody's face right they didn't know and then i had some other guy come attack me he grabbed a chair and started running at me um he was mad and i told him put the chair down or you're next Mm -hmm. you know and uh another guy tackled him and you know long and short and was that point i got on the radio and let you know our dispatch know what had happened and said you know i need other people here quick and uh you know, as part of our protocols, I had already designated you as the person that would, uh, you know, be kind of my personal representative and be my trusted person throughout this whole, anything like this were to happen. Had I perished, you'd have been the person they'd have talked to to go talk to family members and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, but had I not had that that vest, we'd be maybe not even having this conversation, be a very different dynamic. And so, you know, things line up in a way Uh, that doesn't always make sense in the moment, but looking back on it, you can see how things came together. Mm -hmm. And that certainly was the case. And, you know, it was was really good because you got to see me in some very struggling moments through that. And, I mean, you went with me when we went to uh, go down and talk to psychologists and this kind of thing so they could determine whether or not if I was mentally sound to come back to work and this sort of thing. And that's when we had good conversation about you and the experiences you were having. And it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I forget what other departments called that. Are they called battle buddies? What, what, what what your, my official role was, but I know a lot of departments do that. They find the best friend Mm -hmm. and and they help them through and you got to go through all these processes. Yeah. This wouldn't be, so that was our last, I would say close. Well, not close call, but that was our last, um, tumultuous time in law enforcement. Do you remember when I received the phone call, um, Richardson, I think his name was, he wanted to shoot it. His mother called me Mm -hmm. and he said, my son wants to shoot it out with the police, Mm -hmm. right? Any other cop 
I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but anybody else would have just took that as, oh yeah, and just would have hung up. Mm-hmm. But I took that call mm-hmm. and I took it very seriously. And I said, well, what's his name? And I'm getting all the information and I brought it to you because you were like, what was that about? And I was like, look, bro, we need to tell other officers, mm-hmm. some guy out there we were going to pull over, he wants to shoot it out with this. Mm-hmm. And then you were like, well, let's take it a step further. Mm-hmm. You know, let's run through ATF and see who is he? He turned out to be a, a big felon. He wasn't supposed to have firearms. And I think he had a 308. No, he had a bunch of stuff. Bunch of stuff in the car. So the funny thing is, I was supposed to be on that day. We pulled him over yeah. with, and I, th- I don't think you were there either. No, it was it was me and uh, Scott. Oh, yeah, that's right. But you got there late because ATF made the stop. Well, he we were pulling around the corner to pull him over, and he saw the undercover ATF guys and hit the curve, got out, and instantly started shooting at everybody. So I was sick that day. Yeah. And I was supposed to work. And I remember Sergeant Comer's telling me, hey, we're going to get that guy. We're going to stop today. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking, yeah, tomorrow's going to go down. But yep. and, and I end up getting sick. Um, and then I hear, because it was right behind the place I was staying. Yep. And you hear the, the world blocks. explode. <laughs> I hear these, I hear these, I hear gunfire. Yep. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to grab my piece and I'm going to lock down the fort and just at least look out the window to see what's going on. To my surprise, ATF makes the stop on the guy who wanted to shoot it out with this, Mm -hmm. and ATF ends up killing and putting this guy down. I remember that story. Um, I guess my point for bringing that up is this is a good chance for people to see the true work that we have to do and how we become victims Mm -hmm. through our own actions. Right. And for people that look at cops in a – in like a shade of light that is always on the media. You know, it's always whatever stigma they put us out to be. We are just two normal people doing the job that most people don't want to do. Right. And we put our lives on the line for those people to have us discredited or talked bad about. Defund it. Defund it. And in your case, made to be like this murderous cop who was just out for glory, just wanting to kill um, Indian off the reservation. Um, It's just heartbreaking because we're much more than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I do. And it's a hard thing. Walk, walk me through on how they painted that. Well, you know, there's always different perspectives, right? And, uh, one of the first perspectives that, that got thrown out by a lot of the folks who were friends and family with this individual was that he was this harmless human that would never hurt anybody. And that's not a true statement of fact. I mean, the man had a very lengthy criminal history with some very violent crimes against a lot of very innocent people. Um, but he also had some struggles. And he struggled with substance abuse. He struggled with a lot of different things. And so he's a human too, you know. Um but the the Native American community in that area, there was a very vocal portion of that population who wanted to make this into a racial issue, make it a bias issue. Um, you have to realize in, in Wyoming, I was the first white police officer to ever kill a Native American. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one in modern history. I mean, I can't speak before, you know, um, you know, things were the way they are, but you know, this was this was the first time this had happened, um, specifically with Riverton in that area, and that was a big deal. Um, there were portions of the the tribal community who wanted to call for an outright war against, you know, the police and the, you know, the Caucasians in that community, which was crazy to me. There's something where you know I go to try to help this man, he stabs me, and I have to make him stop. I mean, it's a simple simple equation. Um, but it gave some people a narrative that they could build upon and push some other perspectives out there. Um, there were protests, there were marches, there were lots of people um, just creating a narrative for their own personal gain. Mm-hmm. And they didn't care about who it affected, you know. Um, and that was hard. You know, it was really hard because I know my heart. I didn't wake up that morning and say, hey, I'm going to go kill me a native you yeah, know yeah. like that, that thought never crossed my mind but some believe this yeah you know some yeah, wake up crazy. and truly think that police officers get up and that's the first thing on their mind who can i violate who can i kill today yeah. 
Yeah, and if they if they looked at my true history and looked at, you know, or I bothered to ask me a question about what I actually think and what I actually believe, you would know very clearly that I have a very different heart than a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to, you know, be open to everybody. And I genuinely was in this world to try to make a difference and help people. And I tried helping that man too, and he had a different path, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really harmful when those things get, get put out there. And, um, you know, that was hard. That was really hard to just hear those things. I mean, even, even to present day, they have a protest at least once, sometimes twice a year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like a vigilance type of protest, right? Like, oh yeah. Sometimes vigil. they march right down federal Boulevard right. from the, the side of this, this stabbing, um, to the city hall and they'll hold. They'll hold marches and protests and do different things. And, you know, I'm sorry that this circumstance created a wedge in that community, but it wasn't my doing. Mm -hmm. It was just the circumstance that was there. Yep. And to be the center of that and to have um, those narratives put out there, it, it doesn't feel good. It, it's hard. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the situation is what it is. And I, you know, I uh, I just hope that his soul's at, at peace and he is free of whatever it was that was causing him so much turmoil in life. You yeah. know, I mean, there's a reason the man struggled the way he did and yeah. I never got a chance to find out, but you know, and it created hard things with his family. And, you know, I spent a lot of time working with his family members to try to help them as well. Um, he had some children who were adults, um, who had their own struggles with alcoholism, drug use, different things like that. Um, and a couple of his sons who, in their own right, have some pretty hard uh, perspectives were, you know, basically them and a bunch of their associates uh, put a bounty on my head and the heads of my kids and, uh, you know, basically said, well, anybody that kills him, this is what you get paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a hard thing too. But even with that, uh, I spent time to talk to those individuals on a personal level and hear how their father's death had impacted them and listen to them. I made that choice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were arrested for other things and were kicking and screaming how they wanted to see me, they wanted to kill me. And so I went and talked to them and did it in a controlled environment and gave them a chance to tell me what they think mm -hmm. and hear it. And, you know, say, you know, I'm sorry for your pain, you know, and uh, I'm sorry this hurt you. They even went so far as to um, one of the, kids smuggled a knife into our holding facility and uh, had a plan to uh, try to lure me in to help them and then stab me when I went into their their space and their their cell to try to help them and fortunately um, their significant other told us about that and sure enough they had smuggled a blade into the facility to, for that purpose mm -hmm. and even with that I sat down with that, that human and uh, talked to them and heard them. And we had a, a really good conversation. I listened to their tears. I listened to their, their thoughts and, you know, did what I could to help them. And, you know, people don't hear that, that side of the story. People don't hear mm -hmm. about that, that aspect of things, um, you know, and of the three, three kids, two of them were on a good footing. Mm -hmm. They understand. And I, I did a lot of things to, to help make their lives better and get them help with their substance abuse, get them housing because they're homeless, mm -hmm. do different things to help them out. Um, the other one, I don't know that he'll ever have a different perspective. He just wants blood for blood, you know, and that's, you know, that's his course in life. But I just choose not to disengage or just to disengage and not engage with it. You feel like a part of you has, has had to um, reach out to them because of what, what the outcome was um, just to try to make it right with, with his kids. Now, yeah. well, you, you know where I stand with it. It, mm -hmm. it was either going to be you or someone else. Yeah. He was intent on killing someone that day. Correct. Thankfully, I'm not saying it was you, but you were the most prepared. Any other of our officers didn't have that sort of protection could have possibly died that night. Yeah. And have that kind of training too. Right. You know, and I, and I often reflect back at, you know, hindsight. So, what if an officer died and he stabbed an officer mm -hmm. and someone killed him? Would it, would it then be better to have his death, you know, not recognized like this? Like, does it take two lives to be lost? 
since when is it a, you know, such an outlandish crime to protect your own life? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Well, and this was just at the the start, you know, it wasn't too long after this that uh, things happened in Minnesota and, you know, that circumstance took place. And, you know, of course, this ended up being piggybacked on all of that and it just became a, a national narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get me wrong, there's some very bad people that wear a badge. Yeah. And there's also some really good people. Mm -hmm. And just like any profession or any group of people, there's good and bad. And you have to be willing to to get to know people on the individual level. And I think a lot of times what's lost is people don't take that opportunity to find out who's actually doing what. I mean, nobody knows what I did to try to help his kids. And I didn't do that out of a sense of obligation. Mm -hmm. But from a human perspective, um, if someone I loved was taken from me unexpectedly, I would feel a lot of different ways about that. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody who you might view as responsible for that death to sit down and hear your pain, mm -hmm. I thought that would be a reasonable thing to do. For some closure. Yeah. 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 And and not not necessarily for me, because I was okay with it. No, but, but for them. It was for them. Yeah, for them. You know, because they were harboring a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a whole lot of things. When you're going to the extent to to smuggle a weapon into a, a holding facility in the hopes of just getting a chance mm -hmm. in my throat with that blade, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hate and anger there. And for one, I don't I don't want to foster that or build on that. I want to give somebody a chance to process that out because they don't need to carry that forward in their life. Right. You know, and getting to sit down and let them voice what was there mm -hmm. was for them, not me. Mm -hmm. And because I care about other people, I want to give them that chance. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's so, a big deal. So there's a, well, obviously to me, there's a time to kill. Mm -hmm. And we spoke about that. What's the time to heal? You know, I, I think that's an ever going process, right? And I think you choose one way or the other. You can choose a, a path of destruction or you can choose a, a path of healing. And every single day you're faced with circumstances as to which direction you're going to go. You know, whether it's in your relationship with your significant other or with your family or with people you work with. Every day you're faced with choices and you can choose conflict and destruction or you can choose to take a path of connection. You can choose to take a path of healing and you can choose to be life enhancing or life degrading. Mm -hmm. And we don't always make the best choice sometimes. I mean, people uh, speak for myself. I have certainly been destructive in relationships. And when I look back on it, those are the things in life that I wish I could do different. But then you also have a choice as to what you do with it, right? Mm -hmm. You can choose to move forward and say, hey, when I did or when I said, I was wrong, mm -hmm. right? And you can you can rebuild, you can restructure, you can reestablish that relationship. But you have to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. It's not accidental, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so... I think it's a choice every single day. What did, the, what did the universe prescribe Donahue as a... Uh, uh, healing method. Healing method. What did the universe send you? What did the universe send me? You know, I think it's... I have been very blessed in my life to be able to be empathic mm -hmm. and be able to look at things from another person's perspective. Um, and I think that's a, a, a real gift because I don't think that everybody has that ability. I think sometimes um, folks who get very self-focused and look inward as opposed to outward and try to make everybody's, their experience related to their own, mm -hmm. right? And something that I've been uh, fortunate in is that I will look at circumstances and look at interactions and I can put myself in the other person's shoes and see how maybe I'm being perceived, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so um, that's a gift. I mean, Stacy can certainly speak to 
our relationship if she wanted to about times when maybe I'm, I've overstepped my bounds or I've said something hurtful or been unkind or been unreasonable or fill in whatever descriptor. And, you know, oftentimes I go internal where I think, all right, what am I responsible for in this? And how am I impacting her, right? How am I, um, what am I doing to create this dynamic mm -hmm. and try to see it from her perspective? And there's, there's often times where, you know, I, I do and I try to look at that and try to heal and rebuild those times when maybe I'm out of line or maybe I'm just being unfair or unkind. Mm -hmm. And so I think that all comes back to that willingness to try to see things from someone else's perspective. How did you, um, uh, we always get the story, um, what the cop did, mm -hmm. but very seldomly you ever hear how's, how is the cop handling his, um, you know, his night terrors, his wanting to, you know, find mental peace and mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, I killed somebody and how does anyone, how do you, how did you, re well, I don't think you in essence truly recover, but how have you been, um, working your, yourself through that? Yeah. Like, cause we, we, we don't ever hear that, Donnie. I don't ever hear about someone's recovery process. Yeah. You know what? It's a, it's a different dynamic for each individual. I think, um, some people don't do it very well at all. They turn to alcohol mm -hmm. or drugs mm -hmm. or, you know, they just get angry. They do a lot of different things. Um, I am very fortunate in that, you know, I have an amazing, um, amazing wife and I've had great support with, you know, my brothers and my, my friends, that direction. And so that makes a big difference. Um, just having people that, that genuinely care about your well being. Um, you know, for myself, I, you know, I keep a very regimented workout routine to just manage stress on a daily level. Um, you know, I'm very mindful of what I eat. I don't, uh, I don't allow myself to go down any substance abuse rabbit holes. I don't drink. I don't do any sort of, of drugs. I don't, I don't, uh, heck, I don't, I don't even really like taking over the counter medication unless I absolutely have to for mm -hmm. something, you know? Um, and then there's times where things are just hard and not recently, but in the past where, you know, I've taken the time to go in and talk to a professional about here's what I'm struggling with and here's why and just process through the process, right? And how do you deal with that? And so, you know, it's an interesting question because everybody deals with things differently. And one thing that, um, you know, my my former part of my law enforcement career working in the counterterrorism world, we worked a lot with our military partners, the special forces and SEAL teams and German GSG-9 and different different folks from all over the globe, right? And I was just having a conversation here not too long ago with a friend of mine um, from Army Special Forces. He's a retired sergeant from there and very good man, but he struggles and he has a lot of reasons to struggle. He's had a very hard career and he and I really connect. But something he highlighted to me that I think is really, uh, really telling. He's like, you know, in the military, when we're dealing with hard things, he goes, you have dealt with as much or more, and it's been your own countrymen. It's not been in a foreign land. It's not been, you know, this sort of thing. It's your own people in, inside your own borders that mm -hmm. have tried to do some horrible things to each other and to you and to your team. And you've had to take, you know, some pretty drastic steps on a number of occasions, you know, in this first circumstance we talk about with the stabbing, that's just one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been yeah. a whole laundry list of these through my career. Um, you know, he says, but when I left my team, when I retired out of the military, I walked away with all kinds of support. I had, you know, medical support, you know, they evaluated my, my physical injuries to see, you know, what level of disability I have from carrying all this weaponry and load and all these things. And you have the same injuries, you know, and you don't get anything out of it. You, there's nobody, there's no safety net for you. Mm -hmm. You know, when I leave, I have counselors, I have all these things just ready at my disposal. You don't have any of that. You have to seek that out on your own. Um, and so that was, that was really interesting to hear that perspective from him because we're doing a similar job just in a different scope, you know, in a different, different place. 
Um, but the, the trauma remains the same. And there's, there's some real shortfalls when it comes to American law enforcement and the way we support people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the greatest things that, that happened, you know, that you talked about that ATF engagement. And, uh, you know, I was right there as the bullets are flying in that. And the ATF agents did a great job. And, you know, I was actually the guy that secured the suspect. Right after he went down, I was on top of him mm -hmm. and trying to treat his wounds, you know. Um, and the ATF did a great job. They brought in a team of people that that is their job is to help after an incident like that and give you an opportunity to talk through it and have that shared experience and hear what everybody heard and listen to their experience and their perspective and be there to support one another. And that was really valuable. It was the first time in my career that I'd seen anything like that. Um, and there'd been lots of circumstances just as violent mm -hmm. where we never did anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was neat to see that. And then when I got stabbed, I requested that same team of guys from ATF to come in and talk to all of us. Mm -hmm. And that was really valuable. Yeah. Um, and then about nine months later, I was involved in another one with another officer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to support him, I requested that same team of people come in and that really helped in the healing process. Mm -hmm. But it can't just be a one-off thing. You have to be intentional. Um, those agents and those officers that I've been involved in critical incidents with, I still reach out to them every year on the anniversary of these events and check in on them. And what's most sad is a lot of those guys, when I call them and talk to them, you know, and I keep in touch with them, but every single year I make sure that I reach out to them. And they always say, without exception, you know, you're the only person that ever reaches out to me. Mm -hmm. And that's a sad thing. You know, that's a crazy thing to me that, that these men and these women have put their lives on the line to help other people. And the people that are supposed to be there supporting them just yeah, fade away. Just fade away. Just fade away. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting dynamic. And I don't understand that because um, that's not how I'm wired. Right. right. Well, I don't think... To be an officer, period, you have to be wired a, a certain way. Sure. Um, you recall the shift where I think you called off and I took your weekend shift and I ended up getting um, a male subject who hung himself off a motel bed and right. then a double homicide. Um, not only 30 minutes later, two right. bodies we found stuffed in the closet. Right. Um, I don't know if it's just the chemical makeup in me, but I see it, mm -hmm. right? Oh my God, this dude just hung himself off a motel bed, clever. Mm -hmm. Drank a whole fifth of Jack Daniels, he got a rope from one side of the bed, sat on the other side of the bed and broke his neck. Very efficient. Yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm just going, ah. It's not that I didn't care, but it's like, it's part of the soup, right. you know? Then you get toned out, it's just two officers on, and I'm going to go look at a double homicide. And right. I'm looking at these two young bodies stuffed in the closet, shot in the back of the head. And I'm going, huh, yeah. this is what I get for covering for Donahue, number one yeah. is what I was thinking. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but surprisingly, no one ever came up to ask Christofferson and I, you two had a, you, you seen a lot today. Right. Are you okay? Right. You know, how are you processing this? You right. just seen some what people would say some horrendous things right. in a 30 minute span. But me, because I'm wired different, I don't know how I'm able to do it. But once the uniform is off, I separate from that. Yeah, My, but you also had like 15 years in EMS. too. True. So you, true. You've but been still, but even then, I, yeah. yeah. And it's. I think the brain has a safeguard that protects itself from trauma. You know, I would agree to a point, but I think it always lingers. You know, I, I think it's always there and you can, you can uh, detach mm -hmm. from those circumstances because it's not you and it's not your loved one. Right. It's, right. Uh, it's somebody that you're there, you're there to do a job. And so you can compartmentalize those experiences, but there's always a tether. Right. There's always there's always a scene. There's always an image. There's always something that you even talking about it now. I can see your camera roll in your brain. You can go back and see those visualize things. it. Yeah, yeah, it's there. Right? Well, yeah, and well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because 
the A-team, when we clocked in, they let a suspect go, a fugitive go. They called it off. And you're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to keep an active pursuit. I recall getting on. And I'm with BIA, and we cross. I see footprints, and we cross the river. You, you remember this? Mm -hmm. We cross the river, the BIA agent and I, and it's this classic blown out shack, and the footprints lead right to it. You know, cop world, that's a clue. Yeah. We go there. He's around the back. I'm going through the front. I can obviously see there's pry marks, like someone kicked it down. So I unholster, and I'm going through this building. Right. And I'm looking for him. I know he's in there. We both know he's in there. He's around back, the other agent outside the building. I'm actually in it. And this always sticks out to me and it haunts me to this day. My light from my sidearm swipes past the pallet and a mattress. Mm -hmm. And just as my light swiped, I got the glint or the glint of this of his eye. And it seemed like time had just collapsed in and slowed down. Right. I remember just like looking off to my left, instantly training just kicks in. I point my gun at him and it's it scared me so bad. I didn't know if he had a gun in his hand or because he had to jump on me. Mm -hmm. You know, if he had a gun, I, all rights. Yep. And I thought I cleared the room. Right. Thankfully, I could just see half his head. All his arms and body were still tucked in. And I just remember coming out and giving the commands, you know, show me your fucking hands. I will, I will kill you. BIA hears the commotion comes around and we both got him, and we're just looking at him, and both of our eyes are big. Like he's not really supposed to be there. Like, did we really just find this dude? You know what there I mean? There he is. And here he is. <laughs> we saw the footprints. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. <laughs> da -da -da. He didn't helicopter out. He right. Actually. <laughs> so we get him out and we package him up and he and I just talked about it, you know, before anyone else got there. He's in cuffs in the car, but we just talked about it. We're like, how freaking lucky are we? Mm -hmm. You know, this could have went sideways. Mm -hmm. I could have easily killed this dude mm -hmm. if he had made one wrong move. Right. If he did anything out of the norm other than my commands, he was he was a, he was a dead man. No. Um, so I look back on that and see how it could have had played out. And it always comes back is what if, mm -hmm. you know, what if he had a gun? What if it this and this and that? And I could never let that go. I would see all the shit that we, we see. Mm -hmm. Right. But I could not let that instance go because it played out well, but my mind will not cease to like, what, what were the variables? What did I do wrong? What, did, what did I not cover? Yeah. What did I miss? What did I miss? Yeah. No, and I think that's that's normal because that's a protective measure in your brain so that if you're ever faced with similar circumstance, you're going to remember that and you're going to check those corners a little tighter. You're going to do things a little different. I mean, we, you know, on my team, we had a saying, don't confuse good luck and good tactics. Mm -hmm. Because good luck will get you killed. Mm -hmm. Good tactics will prevail. And if you got lucky, learn from it, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, there's... There's times that, uh, you know, I will relive circumstances. I will um, relive experiences. And typically when I'm sleeping, I mean, there are there are certainly night disturbances for sure. I, I don't have the night terrors like some people do. Mm -hmm. um, but my lovely bride will tell you there are very active dreams that I will have. And she can tell when I'm fighting and when I'm shooting. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, she knows when this is happening and she's very gracious about it and uh, is very calming in those moments. Um, man, that stuff's with you. And it doesn't ever really just vanish. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just part of your your lived experience. But being able to uh, discuss that with people that, one, care about you, um, and two, it's even better if they can relate on a certain level, yeah. right? Um, I, I think that lessens the impact. It and does. And unfortunately... I don't think everybody has that, you know, and I've been right. very, very blessed in my life to have, you know, my brothers across this conversation with me and um, some folks that I've come across uh, to, to just develop those friendships and those relationships to have those hard conversations mm -hmm. and be there to support each other. And then having uh, Stacy in my life has been the greatest gift. Oh, well, what a beautiful transition. Yeah, let's, 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 talk let's, yeah, let's talk about yeah, that. Let's talk about that. What a beautiful transition. Making her 
face turn right Yeah. Oh. Well, she had to know her turn <laughs> was, was coming. coming. Yeah, she coming later. to it. No. Now we're going to take this to a lighter. <laughs> it's you know, uh, I never we never go into a podcast <laughs> thinking we're we're going to just dump into something. We we always off at the hip for whatever reason. I wanted to bring this out just so we can have the contrast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it, it it needed to be it needed to be said. Yeah. Right where other people can learn from it. But the contrast between you and Stacy, it's a beautiful story oh, because yeah. there's more like just tell us the story when you guys first met. You guys kind of remind me of me and my wife. You look inseparable. Mm. Yeah. And when you're That's not it and when you're not in each other's, you know, light, it don't look too good, you know? Yeah. Like you guys really yeah. you guys are Voltron. Yeah, we yeah like we get stronger when we're together. Yeah, 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 hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, Stacy. Yeah. Yes. Who are you? Where did you come from? What planet are you from? <laughs> right. You're now, not from Earth. I, hey, I don't. I don't I can believe answer that. that. She's yeah. an angel. Oh, oh see, well, there well, you that go. That makes sense. All right. Well, we got we got <laughs> a little bit of the backstory. Honey, that, that instantly gave you like fifty you're, bonus points. You're the uh-huh. divine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you guys didn't know you were interviewing. No, heavenly beings. no, 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 no. Well, we do now. Well, I mean, so a hundred your, bonus points. Count yourself. Go on. Yeah. Count yourself. And where do you hide your wings? Yeah. Do angels have wings? She keeps them well hidden. Mm. Mm. He seems to know a lot about you. Yeah. yeah. Spokesperson. Yeah. <laughs> obviously. I'm the spokesmodel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you look damn good. good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Stacy. Yeah. Where, where where what part of this country are you from? Uh I'm a desert girl. So I grew up in Arizona. Arizona. Oh, yep. Okay. Did not like the cold and ended up in the cold. So what? in Colorado. Oh. Yeah. So wait, okay. Let's start back. Born and raised in Arizona. No. No. So Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Michigan, well. Maryland, California, Arizona by the time I was two. You're a nomad. So I was a nomad. Yeah. But, or a gypsy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She just flew everywhere she wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to go here. Yeah. Where's your, where's your fondest memory? Is it Arizona? It is. Okay. Yeah. Let's start from Arizona. Okay. Why Arizona? What happened in Arizona? What's going on? So I am two years old and I am wherever my parents are. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So dad was a vet, mm-hmm. worked for the government in animal things and mm-hmm. ended up starting a private practice in Arizona. Okay. So grew up in the desert, feel very at home in the heat in the desert. And again, didn't like the cold at all, but ended up in Colorado, which is part of our story yeah okay so 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 how'd you guys meet where'd you meet that's gonna be his story oh no 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 no, no, stay he's had his time (laughs) how did you i want to i want to know your version of the story is culprit so my version is i worked at a record store and so it was the you know it's rock and roll it is a very loose environment Mm -hmm. and i remember a cop comes in Cause that's what he was. He was not this human that I know. A very young mm-hmm. version right. of this human. Right. He was a very young. <laughs> what uh, was he dressed uniformed. like? What? Oh, he was, he, was, he was in uniform. Okay. Uniform. And I thought, why is he here? <laughs> yeah. Right. What right. were you wearing, by the way? Do you remember what you were wearing? I wouldn't, but he tells me what I was wearing. What was she wearing, Donnie? Oh, she was wearing these tan kind of flowy pants. Mm-hmm. You know, like had... bell bottom type pants or. Oh, just talking seventies rock here. No, no, no. Okay. just just like yeah, like a linen kind of, you know, tannish oh, colored pants. How long ago was this, Donnie? Oh, it was twenty four years ago. This is where I was getting to. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. guy pays attention. Twenty something. He remembers years. to the day. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What yeah, was she wearing? And that, and then she had a uh, kind of off white colored, uh, it was sleeveless, mm-hmm. um, V neck, just kind of shirt that matched the pants. Very stylish looking, you know. Yeah. Um, looked very home at the record store. She had these uh, glasses with gold, gold, gold frames. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. And I, I walked. You did in some number on him, ma'am. I mm-hmm. walked in and got struck by lightning. Yeah, you yeah. did. That's the reality. Yes, yeah. you did. Yeah. So you were thinking, right why is this cop here? Exactly. And well, I thought he's he's up to something. Well, how did you feel about <laughs> cops back then, though? Uh, definitely, they were the 
not the bad guys, but they were the ones to watch out for because they were going to hem you up somehow. Right. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't an instant. It wasn't a hatred. It wasn't a like, but it was certainly, what are they going to do? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what was your lifestyle at the time you met him in the record store? It was very, to me, very kind of hippie, bohemian-ish kind of lifestyle. It wasn't. I wasn't into the drug scene, but that was very prevalent. You had a lot. It was Colorado. You had a bunch of people that smoked weed. And, you know, it was kind of that very party-ish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really a part of it, but I was always into music. And so that was my connection to get to live in that area and get to have, you had to have a job. So I thought I had the best job Mm. with the records. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So so what happens next? Does Donnie say something Foolish? No, what's crazy is I didn't know the story that he just told you until probably two years ago. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you didn't have any of that tied to him? Nope. I had what? Yeah. I I, I showed up and bought a Cypress Hill record. Are you serious? (laughs) Which which record was it? Uh, The one with Cock the Hammer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Red and black one. So what did that say to you? Like that... Was there anything that popped into your mind like, oh, this guy is cute. I kind of like this guy. Nope. Not, <laughs> even, a, not even a little bit. I was, I was a man. Yeah. <laughs> you stay away from the man. Really? Because <laughs> we stayed in, we ended up connecting later, and I didn't remember who he was. Mm-hmm. He remembered me but didn't tell me that. And then I would, I would see her driving. Camp. I would see her driving around in uh, and you didn't her boss's car. He had this old <laughs> Chevy Nova that was just a total beater. Mm-hmm. You and I might say that FPS. car looked a little suspect. Could possibly house individuals who have mm. not taken care of mm. said legal obligation. Yeah, that's maybe the, someone driving that. Just a proper may have a author. All right. Yes, quite possibly. <laughs> and I will say, <laughs> they talk about profiling. The car was profiled. Because I I learned you're going to get pulled over at least maybe once a week, once every other week. What car was this? It's like it was an old, 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 kind of like the muscle car looking, except junkered out. Oh, Oh, like different colored quarter panel, different colored door. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It was rough. Um, It was rough. But I'd see her driving around the community and I'd just wave and she'd. So small town. (laughs) Wait, small town. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the the live in population and. In Summit County is probably only about twenty five thousand people. That's the that's small. People that live there. Smaller yeah. than that, I would say. Okay, but the the any given weekend there could be up to a half a million people in that area. You didn't make any any advancements while in the record store. No, because we were both. Well, I didn't know it at the time with her, but at the time I was engaged to be married to another woman. Mm. Okay, and uh, you know I couldn't allow anything like that to yeah go in in, mm-hmm. in that, and so I remained admirable even though. I was like, holy smokes, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And I, I didn't act on any of it. I just stayed my course. And, and stone-faced, yeah. just like that. So Through years of friendship, because then we end up developing a friendship through mm-hmm. other things. So how long have you worked at the record store? Was that like your main thing for quite some time? So I was doing that, and I worked at the radio station. Mm-hmm. And so then kind of morphed from... Less record store, more radio, and then ended up doing radio for a living. Okay, let's so. back up. Let's back up. What? How did you know you were going to get into music? Was this always a thing? I think so. I think as a kid, it always moved me. I had parents that were not music people. I didn't have siblings that were music people. So mm-hmm. a lot of people, that's how they come to music is family or older brother or older sister. And I had to find it on my own, and I found that was... That was my jam. That was my comfort. That was my, that was what I liked. That's that, what made me feel the best. That's yeah. curious because, or, do you know how to play any instruments? I, you know, as a kid. So yeah. I went through piano and flute and guitar and piano and all sorts of things. But And that's interesting that you didn't choose to like be a, a, a musician and go on stage. But you found another hobby within music. Exactly. Uh, a musician, it, it, you don't have to be playing yeah. something to right. be a musician. musician. Yeah. You know, to, in my eyes, if you're heavily involved, you could be a producer, you could be mm-hmm. an engineer, you could be shit, even a marketer. 
but that's just the passion you have for music. For music yeah. So so did you end up going to school eventually and like, hey, I want to be in radio? I did radio in college, but wasn't studying it. And okay. so it never occurred to me you could do it for a living. I okay. figured I was uh, a political science major, as you were. Yep. I uh, ended up moving up to the high country for a boy. Not was, this boy. No. No, obviously not. Obviously. Jeez. She had to get her head right. That's right. So did you, my good sir. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right. yes, indeed. Yeah. And, <laughs> and got a job at a radio station. <laughs> and it, I realized, oh, you can do this for a living. And so I've been doing that for a long time. So like doing, <laughs> like doing what in particular? Like a DJ or? Okay. So started off on air, worked my way into one point was operations manager, which means you're in charge of everything that isn't sales, mm -hmm. which is kind of takes the fun out of it because I wanted to stay in the music realm. And so now I am the music director, so I don't have to deal with all the other business parts of it, which right. is great. Be so I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go so ahead. I get to be on the air and pick the music. So I get paid to listen to music. So. Do you, the best job. Do you do you do commercials when you're on air? We are commercial free. Oh, but I have in the past. But so, no, see, well, yeah. So commercial free reminds me of eighty eight point one. Yeah, but where you have to do like these. Uh, um, you have to go in and do not like infomercials, but you have to find a way it's called to underwriting. Okay, underwriting. You got it's just the the NPR way of saying. Commercial. So you were so <laughs> wait, wait. So you were an assister affiliate of NPR. So we are related to it in that that's a it's a longer story, but NPR produces a bunch of syndicated programming. Mm -hmm. We have a sister station, mm -hmm. which is what I think of as your typical NPR station, which is you know, you hear the the it used to be car talk and you'd hear all of those shows. We are music driven. So that's all we have is music. Mm -hmm. We program everything in house, but we have some loose ties to mm -hmm. NPR. So they really don't have anything quite to do with our side. So that's a terrible answer do, for, <laughs> do you think NPR has changed from the old, from the older days to now? I didn't know it well enough uh -huh. in the past. Uh -huh. So um, real quick, you got to humor us. Okay. Me I'm going to close my eyes right now. Pleasure. Lead me into a song right now. What would you say over the air? Like, lead me into a song. I got to hear this, this personality. Mm -hmm. Go on. Any, any Go song. On. Lead us into it. Do do uh, Frank Turner's Girl from the Record Shop. Aw. Yeah. I'd have to say Frank Turner, who we know and love, who I'm hoping you got to see at the Stanley Hotel, play four nights of amazing live music. He wrote the song that is the story of my life, with Jim, girl from the record shop, it's Frank Turner on the Colorado Sound. Look at that. <laughs> shit right there. Damn. I'm a Terrible. fan of it. Are you a fan Terrible. of Orson Welles? Yeah. You know who Orson Welles? Or the, the Worlds? Worlds? Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. I will say I got in a tiny bit of trouble. 